The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 121217 in the name of Kezia Dugdale on support for rape crisis centres and prosecutions. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Kezia Dugdale to open the debate. Seven minutes please, Ms Dugdale. Thank you, President Officer, and can I thank colleagues for staying for the debate on what I believe is a critically important issue. The motion before us has four key themes. The first is to recognise that there is a broad commitment across parties for the equally safe strategy and that much good work has taken place to improve the justice system. Secondly, that the recent change in policy from the Crown on compelling reluctant complainers is a retrograde step one which is heavily opposed by campaigners who believe it will jeopardise both the well-being of survivors and their access to justice. Thirdly, that there is an alternative plan, one which shines a spotlight on the system itself rather than the victims of sexual offences. Tonight, I'll detail a five-point plan that Rape Crisis Scotland have prepared. Together, we are calling on the Solicitor General and the Government to pause with their plans to compel witnesses and implement this plan first. The final section of the motion addresses the desperate reality that rape crisis services are under immense pressure and they need adequate and sustainable funding. I know many colleagues in the chamber who are due to speak will talk about equally safe and the funding position of services in their own area. So I will focus my contribution on the problem and the alternative solution. Let me start by saying I'm delighted to see the Solicitor General in her place. And I have a huge amount of respect for her and the job that she does. I approach this debate in the full knowledge that she has spent a large part of her professional life working in the field of sexual offences. She is an impressive lawyer and a formidable prosecutor. But I believe she is wrong on this. The roots of my belief are based on the work of Rape Crisis Scotland, who have for 40 years advocated on behalf of survivors of rape in front of politicians and parliaments and by the sides of victims in our courts. In addition to that, I've read this thoroughly. It's a thematic review of the investigation and prosecution of sexual crimes by the Inspectorate of Prosecution in Scotland, published by the Scottish Government in November of last year. This report tells us that victims believe the court process is utterly humiliating. One woman said it was the most, most degrading experience she'd been through. Another said, court was absolutely horrendous. It was worse than being raped. The first key finding of this report is that there's a lack of information and support available to victims to have any confidence in the system. It goes on to state that communication with victims fell below expected standards in 47% of cases. That the Crown has an unrealistic expectation of victims' understanding of the system that there's too much of an onus on victims to seek updates on their own cases, to find support, to deal with shifts and uncertainties in the scheduling of trials, and to understand the environment over which they have no control. That's just a handful of the findings in an 85-page report. This is what we should be compelled to change. Rape Crisis Scotland have provided me with a personal testimony from a woman they are currently working with. It is a live case, but I have checked the testimony with the presiding officers in advance and there's nothing in this statement which could be considered sub judice. The woman speaking for the first time about her rape said this. When it happened, the police were called for me. It was not a decision I made for myself. I ended up speaking to them in my house at 5 a.m. then spent the whole next day giving a full statement and having forensics taken. I was awake for nearly 48 hours and felt in shock as I spoke to them. I hadn't really had time to process anything or to think about what would happen next, but I was called a day later and told the perpetrator had been released on bail and someone would be in touch about a trial. That was when the reality of the situation hit me and I've thought about the possibility of giving evidence at a trial every day since then. What will it be like to give evidence? How long will it take? How will I be strong enough to answer questions? How can I cope with being cross-examined by a defence lawyer? I first met with my rape crisis advocacy worker shortly after the attack happened. She told me it would be possible to withdraw from the process if I needed to, 
and I wouldn't be forced into giving evidence. When she told me that, I felt a sense of relief that I had some control over the process. When my advocacy worker called to tell me about the change, I immediately panicked and I thought, this can't be happening. I am faced with the reality that there is a possibility they might force me to give evidence. Living every day with that possibility is terrible. I know it may be unlikely, but I can't help but think of the worst case scenario. If I was to go back and have the choice to report, knowing that there was no guarantee I could withdraw if it became too much to cope with, there is a good chance I would make the decision not to report at all. Presiding officer, that's the testimony of a rape victim dealing with the justice system as it is today. But if you prefer hard facts to the raw emotion contained in that testimony, then please look again at the inspection report. It contains an indicted case review of cases that took over 10 months to get to court. It says that in just under half the cases, there was no obvious justification for the length of time taken by the prosecutor to progress the investigation. The delays were caused by the disengagement of the victim in just two cases. I am at a complete loss as to how anyone could read this report and conclude that the answer is to increase the burden on the victim rather than seek to fix the broken system. The report itself even concludes that if the victim is unable to give evidence or their ability is impaired by anxiety, fear, intimidation or a sense of isolation, it is likely to have a significant impact on the outcome of the trial. And that's what we'll be doing if we compel victims to give evidence. So here's what we should do instead. Rape complainers should not have to give evidence in court. Evidence and cross-examination should be pre-recorded. And I was delighted to hear Lord Carloway, Scotland's most senior judge, call for that approach on the radio this very morning. Two, a concerted effort must be put on reducing the delays and changes in court dates. Three, the Scottish Government should commission further research into the complainer's experience of the court process and their reasons for wishing to withdraw. Four, the rules over an individual's sexual history and character being used in court are now over 10 years old. These should be independently reviewed and updated. And crucially, five, rape crisis services must be properly and sustainably funded. No longer can we ask them to do more with less. In conclusion, presiding officer, I don't doubt the Crown's intentions. We all want to see rape convictions vastly improved, but the belief of campaigners and the evidence presented shows that this policy will likely have the opposite effect. So I urge the government and the Crown to think again. Thank you. Open debate, speeches of four minutes. I call Rhoda Grant to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Ms Grant, please. Thank you, presiding officer. It's difficult for me to believe that we're actually having this debate. We know it's difficult enough for someone to report a rape. We also know the earlier that it is reported, the better chance of collecting evidence. But we also know it can be days, weeks, or even years before the survivor feels strong enough to come forward. People feel shame and wonder if they are in some way to blame. They fear the process of providing evidence to the police and they're uncertain about whether they will be believed and afraid of having to face an intrusive examination. Then there's giving evidence in court. What used to be a comfort to a survivor was that they were in control. They could withdraw from the process at any time they felt unable to cope. They could take it one step at a time. That control was not just a comfort, it was healing. Rape is fundamentally disempowering. It's when somebody else takes control of you and forces you to have sex against your will. This not only hurts your body, but it impacts on your confidence and self-esteem, and taking back control is a big part of that healing process. Yet, this policy flies in the face of that. Instead of supporting restoration, it, fully, it further demeans those already at a very low ebb. The Rape and Sexual Abuse Service in Highland wrote to me about this and they said, the judicial process can threaten a survivor's recovery. 
the, proce the process indeed re reinforces trauma. Survivors therefore need to have confidence in their control over the situation and their ability to withdraw should it prove too difficult. Reports of rapes are sadly low and they will be lower still because of this policy. If the Crown Office want to increase prosecutions, they won't do it by victim blaming. Rather, they need to give survivors reassurance to treat them with dignity, respect, and indeed to protect them. More than that, they must protect them from vis vicious lawyers who stop at nothing to get their clients off. And we've seen this all too often, where in any other walk of life, such aggressive behavior and language would not be tolerated. We have to turn our method of prosecuting rape cases on its head. In order to allow survivors to come forward, then we must act, but this is not the way to do it. The Rape and Sexual Abuse Service in Highland tell me that the time between reporting an offence and prosecution is still far too long. Survivors from the Highlands and Islands need to go to Glasgow or Edinburgh or Aberdeen to access a high court, meaning there's long journeys, overnight stays away from family and friends. And they tell me that survivors have travelled to Glasgow only to be told that their case has been postponed. Others have been given less than 24 hours notice that their case is to be heard in Glasgow. They need to book travel, accommodation, time off and often childcare, which is almost impossible in that time scale. Would a woman be prosecuted if she was unable to turn up for any of those reasons? If the Crown Office won't budge on this policy, then the Scottish Government must step in and legislate to stop this travesty taking place. It's unbelievable that someone could report that they have been raped but could end up in jail themselves because they are overwhelmed by the assault and the prosecution process. This policy could lead people to break down or even take their own lives. And we've seen such tragedies in the past as a direct result of rape, rape victims' treatment in court. Yet the law didn't change. Who's responsible for that? Who will be prosecuted for, for the consequential damage or loss of life? This policy must be scrapped. The Solicitor General must engage with specialists who can support women. They need to find ways of improving survivors' experience to encourage more people to come forward and then stay with the process. Then we must also have well-funded support services to help survivors through this process. Presiding officer, this policy is unacceptable and we need to stop it now. Can I just remind all members who wish to speak that they are required to press the request to speak buttons, please. I'm looking at a member who hasn't pressed the request to speak button. I don't want to name them. I call Ruth Maguire, followed by Margaret Mitchell, please. Presiding officer, I thank Kezia Dugdale for bringing this important topic to the chamber. When I first read about this change of policy in the press, I was shocked. I thought it sounded, frankly, awful. Sexual violence is a challenging and difficult issue. It's challenging to even talk about, never mind to report and obtain justice where you've survived it. I acknowledge that there's a careful balancing act between the needs and views of survivors and the issue of wider public safety, an issue which the state has a duty to uphold. I, along with some of colleagues in the chamber here, attended the briefing given by the Lord Advocate and Solicitor General, and it did provide some reassurance. I left in no doubt that the Solicitor General comes at this matter from a position of extensive experience and that the safety and well-being of women are at the forefront of her decision making. I fully appreciate the Crown's desire and deed duty to see more rape cases prosecuted and more rapists brought to justice. In the interests of justice, in the interests of public safety, in the interests of women's safety. The Solicitor General made it clear, speaking in the Chamber last week, that the focus of the revised policy is not to compel rape complainers to testify, but to ensure that the decision, and crucially the responsibility about whether or not to prosecute, lies with the Crown. The public safety case for the Crown on prosecuting a dangerous, violent, repeat offender is obvious. However, it must only ever be in exceptional circumstances that a witness warrant be sought. It is crucial, absolutely crucial, that the complainer, the survivor's views, welfare and interest remain at the heart of the Crown's prosecution policy. And to quote the Crown Office directly, will always be a significant factor in the decision. Failure to live up to this and demonstrate these words in practice would quite simply be unacceptable. 
Whilst I might not agree with the motion that the policy needs to be reconsidered, I do agree that we must all redouble our efforts in addressing the reasons that survivors so often feel unable to continue with the criminal justice process. Confidence in our justice system must be improved. In November 2017, the Inspectorate of Prosecution in Scotland published its thematic review of the investigation and prosecution of sexual crimes. It noted, it noted whilst there had been an increase in the reporting of sexual crimes, a high rate of attrition along with a low conviction rate, particularly for offences of rape and attempted rape, remain concerning. It also noted that secondary victimisation experienced as a result of the trauma of the criminal justice process is a feature associated with crimes of sexual violence. I'm glad to hear that there is going to be ongoing work with Rape Crisis Scotland as to how this change in policy will work in practice and how survivors will be supported. We in this chamber can also play a part in both highlighting the issues, challenging the system, but also in making sure our words and actions don't cause more harm. Victims or survivors of sexual crime must be treated sensitively and appropriately by the justice agencies at all levels and at all times. This policy may be the right thing to do, but if it doesn't go hand in hand with ensuring greater support for survivors, survivors of sexual violence throughout the criminal justice process, it will not succeed in achieving what we all want, justice. Thank you very much. Uh, before I call Margaret Mitchell, I have 11 members still wishing to speak, so I'm minded uh, to uh, accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. I would invite Kezia Dugdale to move the motion without notice. Motion moved. The question is, the debate be extended by 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I now call Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate on the support for rape crisis centres and prosecutions. And I thank Kezia Dugdale for tabling this motion, which begins by welcoming the Scottish Government's broad commitment to addressing violence against women and girls. Under the Equally Safe strategy, there has indeed been significant work done in the Parliament, including passing legislation such as the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Act, the Abuse of Behaviour and Sexual Harm Scotland Act, and the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act, and setting up dedicated units within the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service to deal sensitively and effectively with rape, serious assault and domestic abuse cases. Domestic abuse is now an aggravated defence. In establishing this dedicated unit, unit not only is the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service finally attuned to the trauma rape victims experience and the sensitivity required in dealing with their case but Scotland is acknowledged as leading the way in tackling domestic abuse and violence against women. Furthermore it's essential that the independence of our Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service is protected along with their ability to use prosecutorial direction to prosecute in the public interest. Here, whilst the potential for the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service to issue a witness warrant in order to compel witnesses to give evidence is a long-standing capability, it is the first time that the policy, as it applies to rape cases, has been put into formal COPFS documentation. And as Ruth Maguire stated, the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service has emphasised that the focus of the revised policy is not on compelling rape complainers to testify, but to ensure the burden of prosecutorial decision-making properly lies with the COPFS, and to ensure that decisions are made after the most careful consideration of all the relevant circumstances. There is, of course, a balance to be struck between the interests of the complainer, who is, after all, a member of the public, and the wider public interest. Equally, the reasons why complainers do not come for forward requires further examination and research, and to ensure the necessary support is in place to encourage victims to have the confidence 
to give evidence. Here, organisations like Rape Crisis Scotland are ideally placed to offer their experience of helping and supporting victims. But it and other charities who support must be adequately resourced. Unfortunately, the experience of Lanarkshire Rape Crisis Centre is not encouraging. Although the Scottish Government has provided funding over the past few years, it has been without increase, increment or consideration for the amount and type of work being carried out with survivors of sexual violence across the two local authority areas of North and South Lanarkshire. Consequently, the staff are uncertain about their future employment and service users are uncertain if they will be able to access support in the long term. This is particularly concerning given that some cases can take up to two years to progress through the criminal justice system. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, I therefore very much welcome the Lord Advocate's commitment and the Solicitor General's to continue working closely with support agencies, including Rape Crisis Scotland, to resolve these vexing issues. Thank you very much. I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by John Finney. Mr Johnson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I rise to my feet with a considerable amount of, of trepidation. I'm very mindful as I speak in this debate that I don't have experience in two critical ways. I, I've not been a victim of rape. I've not endured that most horrific of crimes. I, I can only imagine what it must be like to not only suffer the disempowerment that I think Rhoda Grant, I think very well, described, but then to have to go through that again in a court of law. I can only imagine how traumatizing that must be. I can only imagine how difficult that must be to face and, and what you must do to bring yourself to go through that, to relive those experiences, just to ensure that justice is served. But, but nor am I a, a lawyer. I, I've not had to prosecute these cases and I'm very mindful of the difficulties that are faced by the authorities as they seek to do it. But with that in mind, I am supportive and fully uh, aligned with the comments that my colleague Kezia Doug Middale made earlier. I have huge concerns about the policies, both in terms of the way they've been framed, but also in principle. And I support her calls for this policy to be paused and the implementation of her five-step plan. But before I, I set out why, I'd just like to set out very clearly where I think I'm absolute lockstep with what uh, both the law officers are trying to achieve, but I think what probably everyone in this uh, chamber is trying to achieve. That there has to be a very clear priority, three, in my view, clear priorities when it comes to dealing with cases of rape. First of all, we have to ensure that more victims come forward. Now, that is something that does seem to be happening anyway, but we need to go much further. We need to give those victims and those survivors confidence in coming forward so that we can ensure that people do get access to justice, and those people that have perpetrated these vile acts get brought to justice. But we also must ensure that there's a better experience of those people giving evidence who uh, have been victims of rape. And I think Lord Carraway's intervention today is hugely useful, and I think these steps within Kezia Dugdale's plan are hugely important. But above all else, what we need to do is make sure that when these uh, when victims come forward, when survivors come forward, that, that, and and, and uh, the, any improvements we make to their experience, that ultimately that we improve the conviction rate. Uh, it must, must be a, a priority that when cases come forward that we see successful convictions. But let me turn to why I have issues with the, 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 the policy as it's been articulated so far. First of all, I have huge concerns about when reluctance turns to refusal. Now we've heard the, 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 the issues set out by the law officers that, that, in, that they have to give up actions when witnesses uh, are reluctant to give evidence. And we've heard that there would never be circumstances in which a victim would be brought to court in the back of a police car. Uh, but what I have yet to hear is how that is framed, an articulation of when actually the person goes from simply being reluctant to actually refusing. And I think any policy in this regard has to set out very clearly how this would be understood, how this would be assessed, and how individuals who are uh, 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 reluctant, wh 
whether or not they uh, are genuinely giving uh, consent, because they have to be consenting to giving evidence in court. I think that has to be a fundamental principle if we're not going to just simply disempower individuals further. But where is this in this policy? Secondly, there's the argument about public interest versus individual interest. This is a classic utilitarian argument. I understand the overarching desire to make sure that we protect the wider public and, and, and the interest of the individual being balanced against this. But we have to do so with huge sensitivity and huge caution. You know, this is one of these uh, fundamental principles, not just of the courts of justice, but of democracy. We cannot simply trump the rights of the individual around wider interests. And, and yes, there is a balance to be struck, but there needs to be an articulation about how that balance is understood and how it's undertaken. Because fundamentally, this is about trust versus policy. It is vital that any policy has trust, that individuals coming forward trust the system and trust the process. And if they feel they will be compelled when they no longer wish to give evidence, I do not understand how we expect them to trust the system. And ultimately, this is about witnesses coming forward. And if they perceive that they will be compelled to give evidence when they no longer wish to do so, I cannot see that this would do anything other than be a detriment to the, the, uh, the, the principles that I set out at the beginning in terms of ensuring that more people come forward and they have a better experience of the justice system. Can I, I say, I'm sorry, you must conclude. I, I'll conclude I, there. No, you really must. I'll tell you why. If you sit down, please, uh, 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 Mr. Johnson. If everybody goes over by one minute, then we cannot extend further and we won't get everybody in the debate. I've extended by 30 minutes and that's it. So I have to ask speakers, there's a very serious debate. I appreciate it and I'm reluctant to do this, but I must ask you to keep to your four minutes or we can't have everybody in fact. So I'm now calling, my apologies, but that's just the way it is. I call Mr. Finney, John Finney, followed by Tavish Scott. Mr. Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And you're quite right in saying this is a very important debate and it's a very emotional subject. And going back some time in, in my police days, I, I can say there's an outstanding change and imp improvement in attitude and, and response from the, the police service in relation to this. I mentioned that earlier in the chamber this afternoon, the, 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 the confidence that there is in Police Scotland about the handling a lot of these issues. And that's not just in relation to sexual crimes, it's also in relation to dem domestic violence. And key to that is the link in with the, the prosecution, the Crown Office Prosecutor Fiscal Service, and the links that there are there and the more humane handling that, 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 that takes place. Um, part of the weaknesses, of course, are courts. And, and like others, I was heartened this morning to hear Lord Carlowe speak as he did about the opportunities that may exist for um, uh, recording and uh, the, the, the testimony and the, the, the cross-examination because um, uh, there's, there's been legislation that's been alluded to by my colleague Margaret Mitchell there that's been dealt with in this uh, building in recent times, the, the abusive behaviour and the domestic abuse, where, where I've been privileged, and it was a privilege to hear the private testimony of individuals. And I have to say that uh, it, it was harrowing. It, it, it was harrowing, and uh, it shouldn't be that the state's way of helping an individual is to inflict more grief on them. So um, I think terminology is very important. Absolutely, the public interest is, is fundamental. And there were very compelling arguments made by the Lord Advocate and the Solicitor General when I attended the briefing recently there and the obligation that's placed on all of us, all of us, uh, to, to, to act collectively in, 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 in the public interest. But of course, key to that is the, the role of the complainer. And that is the correct team. They are a complainer. Of course, the terminology is for survive as appropriate, but can the, 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 the legal context complainer. And key to that is the well-being of the complainer, because absolutely what's wanted is quality evidence, and you don't get quality evidence um, when you uh, necessarily compel someone. But it is a very, very fine balance, and a couple of the speakers have touched on that. So... Um, uh, but what I would say is that, of course, at the moment, as I understand, victims of sexual abuse of rape are uniquely treated in any case by being given this level of say. That's not a say that's given to necessarily the victim of an assault or, or a housebreaking. And that's important. It's important. That recognition's already there of the significance that placed in that. And the question of disengagement, and that was touched upon in the briefing and the humane response that there is to, to disengagement. Disengagement can be for a number of reasons. And uh, Kizzy Douglas uh, uh, alluded to that report. And, and, and I think there is a lot of information. I think a crucial 
a crucial ask, and, the, and all the asks were reasonable, a crucial ask that I think everyone would go along with was more research. It's to understand particularly what's involved there. And I have to say, if I have one disappointment, it is that although this is a well-attended members debate, it would have been good if there was someone here, a minister here, who had responsibility for money to dish out. Because, of course, key to this is the support mechanisms that are put in place. And uh, I, 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 it may well be that there's other pressing engagements. So I, I, today I met with Rape uh, Crisis Scotland. And I have to say that having met with uh, Ms Brindley and having met with the Solicitor General and, and, and the Lord Advocate last week, I, I don't think there's poles apart here. But what I would say, and I mean this as gently as possible, this is a bit of a PR disaster because we are, are wanting to increase the number of successful sexual prosecutions. And, and key to that is the quality of the evidence. And as I say, the, there are opportunities that will come with Lord, Lord Car Carloway. So um, I'm, I'm sure the Lord Advocate will reflect in, in the points that have been raised there. Can I ask that there's further engagement with Rape Crisis Scotland? Because as I say, I imagine everyone in this chamber is at one with where we should be going. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Finney. I call Tavish Scott to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank Mr. you for signing Scott, off. So firstly, please. can I endorse and agree with Kezia Dugdale's uh, opening speech and the five points that she very powerfully made in Parliament uh, this evening. There's not many times that a sensitive, tricky, difficult, but intensely robust issue is introduced in that way. And it was very powerful and it's, it's very important. I also want to recognise that the Solicitor General and the uh, Lord Advocate are, are here. Um, Kezia Dugdale was quite right about the Solicitor General's track record uh, in this area, and that should not in any way be ignored by uh, Parliament here tonight. But I, sh I am sure that our law officers will want to reflect on what Parliament's saying here this evening, uh, the power of the argument that has been uh, presented to us by uh, many constituents and by organisations that have already been named here this evening, uh, and consider carefully how, how to uh, react uh, to that. I can also entirely associate myself with John Finney and Daniel Johnson's remarks about just being a member. I mean, John Finney was reflecting his previous uh, professional uh, life, but there aren't many more harrowing things uh, as a uh, member of this place than to uh, meet people who have been subjected, and that is the uh, times the word, to the uh, pressure of the process that they are asked uh, to go through and not think there has to be some considerable change. And Kezia Dugdale set out, I think, very five very strong arguments for that uh, this evening. I also want to associate myself with uh, Lord Calloway's observations uh, this morning. Um, I thought some of the observations he made uh, were very powerful indeed, particularly the point about the length of time. Uh, one of the cases that I dealt with at home in Shetland was over the length of time, and Rhoda Grant was quite right about the geographical observation of those of us who represent the far-flung parts of, these, of this country uh, in terms of how far people have to travel and what that does. But it was the length of time and how long this particular person had to deal mentally, never mind physically, but mentally, uh, with, the, uh, with the trauma and ordeal that she had been through that makes me think that Many of the things that uh, Lord Carloway set out uh, the, this morning uh, are, are right, uh, need to happen, uh, and should be taken forward as a matter of some uh, urgency. Can I make two points about uh, Shetland rape crisis and, the Shetland, and Shetland women's aid, both of whom I'm incredibly grateful to for, the, for their candour in uh, telling me in no uncertain terms things that I should be aware of as a legislator and things I should be aware of uh, as a representative. Uh, one of the things that's not needed at home is to lose solicitors who have specialist rape and sexual assault uh, abilities in terms of uh, the role they perform in, in uh, Shetland, and that is one of the dangers that we face at the moment. And they were quite clear about it. And the, the firm that we may lose in Shetland, who were frankly the only firm providing legal aid assistance to women in these circumstances, we're going to lose them because of the legal aid fees. And John Finney was quite right. I mean, Michael Matheson was here earlier, and I'm grateful to the Justice Secretary for being here earlier. Uh, but I hope the government hear us loud and clear. Certainly in my case, there's no two ways about it. Uh, legal aid fees to some of these firms mean the difference between having a firm somewhere like Lerwick providing a service for women. Um, women uh, who have been subjected to rape or sexual assault uh, and not having that firm. And if we don't have them, the points that Rhoda Grant was making about geography become even, even uh, worse. Uh, so I hope uh, the government, uh, if not the law officers, will reflect on that uh, here tonight. Uh, two final points. Um, Shetland rape crisis are supporting in 1718, and this is maybe the point about why these services are so important. Margaret Mitchell reflected that uh, from a different uh, location in Scotland. They're supporting 52 survivors of sexual violence between the ages of 13 
19 and 70, including a number of men, members of the LGBT community, along with women and uh, girls. Uh, and finally, uh, Shetland Women's Aid, who made two points to me. Women do not have confidence in the system, uh, so unreporting needs to become reporting investigation and prosecution. And this, the final point, uh, ask Tavish what it would do to you in terms of the trauma to your body and brain. Your natural body wants to block it out, to go away and to disappear. For that reason and for many other reasons, we need to do a whole lot more. Thank you very much, Mr Scott. I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Jenny Gilruth. Miss Bailey, please. Let me start by congratulating Kezia Dugdale on securing time for this debate and for her powerful contribution this evening. It is good to see the cross-party unity across this chamber to tackle the issue of violence against women and to address the flaws within our justice system in how it deals with reported cases. I do also welcome the government's commitment to the issue through their equally safe strategy because both the physical and mental well-being of rape complainers should, without exception, be our number one priority. However, for too many rape complainers, their experience of the justice system itself is traumatic, and the insensitivity with which some survivors of rape, domestic abuse, and sexual violence have been dealt with is quite simply inexcusable. Up to the 12th of March this year, rape complainers could not be compelled to give evidence in court. But of course, this has now changed, and the Crown Office can effectively compel reluctant rape complainers to give evidence through warrant or arrest. And I accept that they may not wish to do so, but they can. The personal testimonies of women who have battled in the justice system to have the despicable things that they have gone through recognised is beyond heartbreaking. And Rape Crisis Scotland have issued warnings of the consequences that could result from this change in policy. Can I note my disappointment, presiding officer, that the offer from Rape Crisis Scotland to work with the Crown Office on this following the consultation meeting on the 30th of August 2017 was actually not taken up. Rape victims already find it difficult enough to present the evidence for their case, and many find the hostility of the criminal justice process as a key factor in their reluctance to come forward. One victim found their experience of the justice system, as Kezia Dugdale has already said, but I think it's worth repeating, that it was worse than rape itself. So that surely cannot be tolerated any longer. And you know, whether we like it or not, we live in a society where rape complainers are not naturally believed. Their character comes under intense scrutiny. Their story is pulled apart, usually far more than in the case of a non-sexual crime. And their willingness to continue the fight is often lost amongst the negativity of the system. Studies carried out by Rape Crisis Scotland have found that with this new policy, there is likely to be an increase in women falsely admitting to having made up their testimonies as the only way out of the distressing ordeal. So it's clear that under this new policy, rape crisis will not be able to reassure clients that they won't be prosecuted for not appearing in court, something that they had previously found crucial to keeping women within the system. The fact that the process is so traumatic that women feel compelled to deny their own rape should make us all feel utterly ashamed. An additional issue within the criminal justice process in relation to how it tackles rape complainers is the lack of consistency. Rape complainers are often left for long periods of time before their cases are brought to court. There is a distinct lack of communication surrounding the locations and timings of hearings, both of which are often subject to a number of changes. And this simply adds anxiety to what is already a traumatic experience. Presiding officer, rape complainers deserve better. They've been given a voice by organizations like Rape Crisis Scotland, but far more needs to be done. Instead of pursuing this flawed approach, can I commend the five asks put forward by Rape Crisis Scotland to the Crown Office. For current and future rape complainers, we must ensure that the justice system provides closure to trauma, not a continuation of it. This policy must be scrapped. Thank you very much. I call Jenny Gilruth to be followed by Maurice Corrie. Ms Gilruth, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I commend Kezia Dugdale on bringing forward today's motion forward on an issue which I know reflects her personal conviction and political commitment. Uh, I'd like to focus my contribution today on the final se uh, section of the motion, which calls on adequate funding for rape crisis centres. 
Over five months ago, I raised the plight of Fife's Rape and Sexual Assault Centre directly with the First Minister. Three weeks before Christmas, the organisation was unequivocal in their assertion that a 2.5% funding cut from Fife's Health and Social Care Partnership was to blame for the closure of the organisation's waiting list. This was not a decision that the organisation took lightly. The First Minister was equally unequivocal in her response. She said, services like this are absolutely vital in protecting the most vulnerable women and children in our country. And I hope all of us, whatever political disagreements we might have across the chamber, could come together and support the work that organisations like the Fife Rape and Sexual Assault Centre do for the benefit of Scotland. Exactly a month ago, I was delighted to hear that Frazac had reopened their waiting lists. I got in touch with Jan Swan, the centre manager based in Kirkcaldy. The waiting lists were reopened. Surely Fife's Health and Social Care Partnership must have seen the light. Alas, no. Despite additional funding from the government, which is helping to support Frazac's advocacy service, local cuts via the core funding provided by the partnership continue to affect service provision. Presiding officer, we're not talking about huge sums of money here. 2.5% of Frazac's core funds equates to just £977. Rape Crisis Scotland's research reveals that what that actually means for victims of rape who live in Fife, the third largest local authority in the country. On Monday the 8th of October, Fife had 83 people waiting to access a support service, the third largest number in the country. But the wait time for support does not match up because rape victims in Fife can expect to wait up to 10 months for support. That is the highest waiting time in Scotland. It is completely unacceptable. But numbers mask personal stories which mask suffering and pain. Just consider the eightfold increase between 2014 and 2018 for those aged between 13 and 15 years old. Or the fact that since 2014, the total number of cases recorded by the service have increased from 213 to 280. The upward trajectory of women presenting to services across the country needs attention. It needs encouragement. It needs financial support to enable a culture whereby women feel able to report rape or sexual assault when it occurs not because the system compels them to do so. This has to be about a cultural shift. I do appreciate that the Solicitor General has previously responded to questions on the Crown Office changes on compelling reluctant complainers to give evidence uh, in the Parliament. But as Sandy Brindley of Rape Crisis Scotland has said, our view, having supported survivors the length and breadth of Scotland uh, for years, is that the route to improving justice for rape survivors is not by forcing them to engage with a broken system, but to fix the issues inherent within the system. Presiding officer, Scotland has one of the highest rates of imprisonment for women in Northern Europe, and I remain unconvinced that the Crown's actions will tackle that inequality. Rather, I fear that compelling reluctant complainers to give evidence in rape cases will compound a culture within Scotland's legal system, which too often makes victims, female victims feel themselves like criminals. And I understand the rationale behind the Crown's actions here. None of us would agree that a 5% conviction rate is evidence of a system which works. Conversely, pushing women who have already been through horrendous trauma into giving evidence is surely not the answer. In closing, presiding officer, I hope the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service will now think again and listen to the views of women who have been through the system because this is what they were told in the Inspector of Prosecution's thematic review which has previously been mentioned today. On opening the letter, the first thing I saw was the name of the person who attacked me in black bold letters. It was very distressing. In our court system, you are totally humiliated. It was the most degrading experience I have ever been through. And Jackie Bailey is right, this is worth repeating. Court was absolutely horrendous. It was worse than being raped. Let's listen to these women's voices. Let's listen to the experts at Rape Crisis Scotland and let's ensure Scotland's legal system really works to support all victims of rape and sexual assault. Thank you very much. I call Maurice Corey to be followed by Alec Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I will begin by thanking Kezia Dugdale for bringing forward to today's debate, the debate on this very important subject. I want to take the opportunity as well to note the work of rape price, the rape crisis centres which work with people in my region, although not located in my region specifically. I have heard of the amazing work that they are doing to support rape victims in the, in the west of Scotland. The Glasgow and Clyde Rape Crisis Centre, who do outreach work in East and West and Bartonshire, the Argyll and Butte Rape Crisis Centre based in Danoon, and the Star Centre located in Kilmarnock, amongst others, are doing amazing work in West Scotland. And I'm sure that we, they have the gratitude of absolutely everyone in this chamber today for that work. Moving on to the subject of compelling reluctant complainers in rape cases to give evidence in court, it is a very difficult topic, and I've had to spend a lot of time thinking about it in the run-up to this evening's debate. I think we can all agree that this is an area where we need to strike the right balance. 
<clears throat> what we have come up against is a difficult task of attempting to juggle the needs of rape victims and their welfare, the needs of prosecutors, prosecutors doing their best to protect the public from serious sexual offenders and the needs of the courts to have enough information and evidence to find someone guilty beyond reasonable doubt. I think that the balance which the government and the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service have sought needs to ensure that rape victims are not put off from coming forward and that they feel supported. Of course the reason for doing this is obvious. The latest official statistics show that just 39% of those taken to court were found guilty, down from 49% in the previous year, which is the lowest conviction rate since 2008-09, when it was 37%. The drop became, came despite the number of in-court proceedings last year rising by 13%. We all know this is a massive issue which we need to address, but by going around that, by compelling witnesses to appear and give evidence against their wishes, I fear won't help the overall situation. It makes it worse by reducing the number of women coming forward to the police in the first place to tell them they have been raped. In an interview with BBC Sandy Brindley, which has been referred to before, of the rape crisis Scotland, uh, said, and I quote, one of the key reassurances we are currently able to give people is that if they don't feel able to proceed, that their wishes will be respected, but this will be gone. I do have concerns about the unintended consequences of this policy around women not seeking help from the police or charities out of concern of being forced to give evidence in court, and I know that would concern the government as well. Kezia Dugdale's motion speaks admirably of the need to reconsider this policy, and I think that this would be most appropriate course of attention at this point. When you have the charities like Rape Crisis Scotland telling you that you are going around something the wrong way, then it is important that the government listens to that advice. And in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, what we need is to create an environment where it is easier for women to come forward and tell their own story in court, and by supporting them in that process before, during, and after the hearings. In that way, we can ensure that the conviction rate goes up, proper justice is delivered, and that victims receive the care and support they deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Corey. I call Alec Cole Hamilton, to be followed by Claire Baker. Mr. Cole Hamilton, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I too add my thanks and congratulations to my friend and colleague, Kez Dugdale, for bringing this hugely important motion before us this evening. Um, until very recently, public discourse around rape and sexual assault was shrouded in false assumptions and stigma, and many of those still exist and endure. I carried some of them myself, and I'm uh, ashamed to say, but I'm very glad to say that joining the task force on violence against women, as I did um, some three years before I was elected, helped me to understand the profound and dehumanizing impact that rape and sexual assault can have, not just on women, but on men as well, but predominantly on women. It was in that group that I was proud to play some role in shaping Equally Safe, which has uh, been referenced a number of times today. That work was also underpinned by my membership of the task force on child sexual exploitation. I say that because actually many of the themes we discussed in that task force um, were apposite to, to, I think, some of the solution around changing the culture. And I, I mean, by which I mean the understanding of safe relationships and consent and respect that we need to grow and germinate within our children and young people as they understand uh, the environment of, of relationships and, and what healthy relations look like. So our response to rape has to be a whole systems response, but I'm very uh, glad that Kez Dugdale has focused her motion today on our criminal justice response. It is, I think, very easy when we have members' debates to use them as a forum to sort of uh, uh, bemoan the situation, to, to wail and gnash teeth and, and cry foul about the many things that are, are wrong with the situation. But I think it, uh, Kez's five-point plan represents a very powerful index of positive action that we can take forward and our criminal justice colleagues can take forward uh, to make things all the better. I welcome, as many have said, the President of the Court of Session, Lord Carloway's uh, response this morning, I think in part perhaps to this, uh, this evening's debate, on making it easier for people to come forward and give evidence outside of court. And, and I, I cer certainly lend my support to that. But actually, um, I want to touch on something I think Daniel Johnson articulated very well, and that is that, that dichotomy of that utilitarian need to see more 
rape cases brought to justice and the needs of the individual complainant. And, and that was actually something that came up in our Equalities Committee inquiry into human rights in the Scottish Parliament, in that we have competing human rights in this. We have this the macro meta-narrative of the human rights of our society not to have rapes continue, but we have the rights of the individual to be protected from being re-traumatised. And I think and that is why I am compelled that the advice and the, the policies of Crown Office Procurator Fiscal in compelling reluctant complainers are, are absolutely, whilst um, meant of the best intentions, will have unintended profound human consequences for the individual. It's not hard to understand how they got there. You know, the fact that we have something like 1,800 rapes reported in the last year, yet only 270 brought to prosecution, is a scandalous statistic. It's a, te a terrible statistic. But it's part of the reason is not people's reluctance to come forward, it's their confidence in the system. The fact that those 270 cases actually only reported, uh, resulted in 120 25 convictions should undermine anybody's confidence in the system and not uh, add to that and my friend Tavish Scott made the point very uh, uh, well I think that you have a colossal amount of time to wait before you have your day in court before you have that moment to tell your story but at many points along that journey you are being re-traumatized so I thank Kez Dugdale once again for bringing this important debate to the Parliament tonight. I assure her, obviously, of our continuing support in this. And I think her five-point plan represents a really positive and progressive step to taking this debate forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Coolhampton. I call Claire Baker, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and thank you to Kezia Dugdale for securing this important debate. I think there is a strong recognition in the Chamber this evening that we must do all we can to dramatically improve the situation that victims of rape are experiencing, from the support which is provided to them, from the public perception and understanding of the crime, to the way in which our criminal justice system deals with these heinous crimes. It is hugely frustrating that the conviction rate for rape remains significantly lower than for other crimes. And these are cases that do have the required corroboration. Research has currently been undertaken into jury decision making. And it is important this includes the role of the jury in rape cases and can help inform any reforms going forward. Um, I recognise the commitment of the Crown Office and the Solicitor General, who has spent her career fighting for justice for victims of rape and sexual assault. But the recent change in policy is very concerning. Rape Crisis Scotland remain concerned about the policy leading to victims retracting their complaint and the policy not recognising that the criminal justice process itself is what is causing the problem. Um, I attended the Crown Office briefing in Parliament the other week and what struck me as the Solicitor General talked about the experience of supporting a reluctant rape complainer was the degree of experience, expertise, empathy, judgment and commitment that could convince a victim who does not want to present evidence in court to continue with that trial. And in the chamber last week, the Solicitor General said she hadn't come across a case where this would be used in the last 10 years. And the situation where a victim would be arrested, even imprisoned, seems so unlikely and against everything that the Crown Office is wanting to achieve, that it then appears unnecessary unless it is to act as a threat or a warning to the victim, which in itself does not justify itself as a way to treat victims of rape. As Jenny Gilruth has described, Fife Rape and Sexual Assault Centre had to close its waiting list in December after being overwhelmed by rising demand for their service. And in Fife, 893 sexual crimes were reported last year, but we know that the real figure is higher. Perth and Kinross Rape and Sexual Abuse Centre contacted me yesterday and between April 2017 and March this year, their support service has seen an 8% increase. And as funding becomes increasingly challenging, they have had to cut a support post and their waiting times are increasing. And in reply to me when I raised the situation in Fife, Angela Constance said the Equally Safe Delivery Plan commits to a review of funding and commissioning. And this needs to be fully recognised, the need to address waiting times, funding pressures and staffing difficulties. The Fife Centre manager, Jan Swan, also spoke to me about the difficulty they have recruiting support workers, volunteers and fundraising. It's not an easy field to work in. Fife has well-supported charities with many volunteers who are working in food groups, sorry, food banks with children and family groups or with older people's groups. But it is more challenging for rape crisis centres to recruit volunteers for what can be difficult work. We need to think about how we can support their efforts. But what we really need to think about is how do we stop this crime, which is only on the increase. 
I visited Perth Rape and Crisis Centre's 10-year exhibition last year. It was an exhibition to make you angry, emotional and uplifted. There were messages of hope and recovery, but also a clear demonstration of the injustice of sexual assault and rape. They do outreach work into local high schools, challenging ideas of young people, encouraging them to interrogate their views on sex. They are speaking to the next generation to try and change and try and change their prejudices and behaviour. This is work that is not core funded, but it is essential if we are to see change. In closing, one of the most affecting displays in the exhibition was a rail of women's clothes, representing the clothes that women wore when they were raped. There was a flannel nightie, a pair of jeans, a wedding dress. Now, these are clothes that reflect women of all ages and all social classes. This is a crime that reaches all parts of our society, one we must confront and one for which victims need to have justice. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, Kenneth Gibson, followed by Monica Lennon, and Monica Lennon will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Gibson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I, too, congratulate Kezia Dugdale on securing time for, to bring this vitally important issue to the Chamber. This is a complex and emotive issue. The recent change of policy by the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service of compelling and reluctant victims in rape cases has clearly been met with opposition and concern from charities, individuals and MSPs alike. As members will be aware, on 25th of April, my colleague Christina McKelvey sought assurances from the Solicitor General that the victims would not face potential prosecution for ignoring a witness warrant if one was sought by the Crown. However, the Solicitor General was unable to give this reassurance. I understand that this would and could only happen in the most exceptional of cases, and that only after careful assessment and consideration of all circumstances would any decision be taken. The Crown states that the victims' interests, welfare and views are at the heart of prosecution policy in relation to victims who are reluctant to complain and that the policy underlines the importance of exploring the reasons for such reluctance. However, it is vital that we do in no way alienate, discourage or traumatise women with the bravery to come forward and reveal what has happened to them. In 2016-17, 1,755 rapes and 123 attempted rapes were reported to Police Scotland. However, these figures are undoubtedly the tip of the iceberg. Many women understandably feel scared and unwilling to report an attack for a host of reasons. It is therefore vitally important that women who report rape and sexual assault and intend to proceed through the criminal justice process must be supported and feel that their case is going to be dealt with appropriately and with understanding. A major reason many victims choose not to report rape is the criminal justice system itself. For those who do, Lengthy delays in cases coming to court and lack of meaningful, meaningful communication often lead to these women feeling that they can no longer cope and they lose heart and have to withdraw. It's inherently wrong that people who have already been through such a traumatic experience and have shown the resolution and resilience to report rape may face the possibility of being presented with a warrant. Such a policy could see such women being punished by the very system that's supposed to protect them. While figures for many crimes in Scotland are going down, the number of reported sexual offences continues to rise. Reported sexual offences have been on a long-term upward trend since 1974 and have increased every year since 2008-9. Sexual crimes are now at their highest level since 1971, the first year for which such comparable crime groups are available. This is, of course, due in large part to the fact that increasingly and rightly women feel better able and supported should they report the crime and take it forward through the justice system. It is consequently our responsibility to ensure that women feel safe and have confidence that their case will be dealt with sensibly should they wish to report what has happened to them, uh, uh, not fearing prosecution should they later wish to withdraw. The Scottish Government's strategy, Equally Safe, has clearly set out that violence against women and girls in any way, shape or form has no place in Scotland. For over a decade, the Scottish Government has helped to form a justice system for survivors of gender-based violence, which ensures they are responded to appropriately and with sensitivity and understanding. And I welcome the deliber deliberations of Lord Carnaway um, this morning. We must continue going, f uh, this, uh, going forward in order to build a safe and successful Scotland for everyone. Presiding officer, I understand the Crown is committed to continue working closely with Rape Crisis Scotland and with other agencies to improve the experience of victims. And I welcome this ongoing work with Rape Crisis Scotland and hope the Crown takes on board the important discussions and points made here today across this chamber. To ensure every woman in Scotland feels supported should the worst ever come to pass, particularly regarding the very system designed to protect them.
Thank you very much, Mr Gibson. I call Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to also thank Casey Dugdale for taking the urgent action to secure cross-party support to allow this important debate to, to go ahead tonight. And also to pay tribute to her for her tireless work in giving voice to women everywhere, but especially to survivors of sexual violence. And I'd also associate myself with the remarks that have been made um, acknowledging the accomplishments of the Solicitor General. This debate is not an easy one to take part in, but it is a timely one. Um, it's taking place against um, the wider social movement around Me Too and I Believe Her. Women's experience of sexual harassment and sexual violence has been spoken about more than ever from Hollywood to Hollywood and every school and workplace and community in between. And it does feel like as a society we are making tens of steps towards a culture change and I'm optimistic about the pace of the progress that we're making. So it was therefore with anger and disbelief that I reacted to the news that the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service had a policy shift compelling so-called reluctant complainers of sexual violence to give evidence. And like other colleagues here tonight, I also attended the briefing that was um, delivered by the Lord Advocate and the Solicitor General uh, on this policy change. And, you know, none of us doubt the commitment to seeing dangerous perpetrators of sexual violence being put behind bars in order to protect women and deliver justice. But when so few reported rapes make it to prosecution and conviction, I do understand the desire to see justice and to protect women from harm. But like, as colleagues have said tonight, in doing so, we can't neglect the wishes and the well-being of survivors of sexual violence. We know that sexual crimes are underreported. One of the main barriers to rape survivors accessing justice is the justice process itself, which is often lengthy and insensitive to rape survivors' feelings. We've heard and we know that rape survivors worry they won't be believed, worry they will somehow be blamed you know, about what they're wearing. But we've heard powerfully from Claire Baker that it doesn't matter what you're wearing, you know, it's never, it's never the fault of the victim. And women worry that they will be compelled to relay the most intimate details about their lives in court. It is a brutal system. And we see one high profile example after another in the UK and beyond where rape survivors are subjected to a hostile court environment and perpetrators are acquitted or given a sentence that does not seem to reflect the seriousness of the crime. Sorry, presiding officer. Um, I, I, I listened carefully to the Solicitor General um, a few weeks ago and I, and, I, and I wanted to be persuaded and she was very persuasive and she talked about how women can feel empowered uh, by giving evidence and that engaging women and re-engaging women uh, is something which is approached in a, an emotionally intelligent fashion. And, and I do believe that people uh, in the legal profession, in the judiciary, believe that that's the way they're approaching it. But I have to say, we have to listen to Rape Crisis Scotland. We have to listen to the women's voices who are not being listened to. And I am concerned we've reached a place where we have a disconnect, where Rape Crisis Scotland wanted to engage, wanted to be part of a consultation and feel that that hasn't happened. So I think I am the last speaker and I, I won't go over time, but I, I do want to say, presiding officer, I think we do need to press pause. We have a five point plan developed by Rape Crisis Scotland and Kezia Dugdale. And I think we're at a place today where the confidence of rape survivors is going to be at an all time low. We have to press pause in order to get this right. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. And I call on the Solicitor General to close the debate. Thank you, Deputy. Up to seven minutes, please, seven or minutes, thereabouts. Yes. Um, I, I too thank Kezia Dugdale for bringing this matter to, to the Chamber and giving me an opportunity, actually, which I feel is really important now to clarify what this policy is and what it is not. And I say again from uh, the question answered last week and from the briefing, this is not a policy to compel rape victims to come to court. Um, can I just add as well, this is not a Scottish government policy. This is a policy of the Lord Advocate as head of the Independent System of Prosecution in Scotland, um, at whose side I stand four square. 
and uh, for as long as I've got breath in my body and uh, a, a law officer will continue to do all I can uh, to vindicate the rights of uh, victims of rape and to pursue justice for those who perpetrate it. Um, the change in policy, the change in prosecution policy, Deputy Presiding Officer, is not about compelling the victims of rape um, to give evidence. It is about being clear and honest with complainers and those who support them that the decision whether or not a case is prosecuted is a one for the Crown. That being the case, and it has to be the case, not because I want it, not because I think it's a good idea, but because the law and ethics tell me that it is necessary. That decision has to be taken by the Crown. It's then about making sure and making clear that the views, interests and well-being, welfare of the victim is at the heart of decision making by the Crown. So that if a witness, if a victim being supported by rape crisis or not, because of course not all of the victims we deal with have advocacy workers. We deal with a wide range of victims with a wide range of, of issues um, leading to reluctance. Their views and welfare are at the heart of our decision making. If they become reluctant because they can't cope, because they, are, uh, they have mental health issues, if it will harm their well-being, that is a massively important factor. Of course it is. And in the balancing ex exercise, I think Mr. Corey referred to that, in the balancing exercise that we have to undertake in the public interest, uh, on the one hand, bringing perpetrators to justice, protecting me, you, our daughters, our sisters, our mothers from future victimization on the one hand, and looking at the impact of giving evidence on the, on the victim on the other, that balancing exercise is one which we need to take in the public interest independently. It is the right thing to do. And this policy is all about doing the right thing. Because before the policy change, complainers of all kinds, whether supported or not by uh, advocacy workers, effectively had a veto on the prosecution of serious sexual offenders. If they stated that they were reluctant, that was an end of the matter. And that was treated as decisive. And often given that understanding, the reasons weren't explored. So in that uh, context, we had a situation where very, very, very difficult decisions had to be made. Yes? Kezia Dugdale. I thank the Solicitor General for taking an intervention. I'm listening very carefully to what she has to say. So can I invite her to respond to the reality of the testimony that I put forward? That for women who have been raped, the idea that they could be compelled, having that knowledge in advance, means that they may not report at all and she would have no cases to prosecute. Solicitor General. We've discussed this with Rape Crisis and we will be working with both Rape Crisis and Police Scotland because it is absolutely essential that in dealing with victims, in encouraging them to come forward, in supporting them in that process, they are not threatened, they don't feel threatened by the risk of compulsion or imprisonment. That would be wholly inappropriate and we do not want to see any chilling effect on the willingness of victims to come forward. The fact of the matter is that the, the, the responsibility for taking decisions on prosecution lies with the Crown. And for all other cases, murder, serious organized crime, ch child cases, the end option involves the power in appropriate cases to compel the witness and to seek a warrant and, and to enforce it. I repeat, Deputy Presiding Officer, that will happen in the most exceptional and rare circumstances. And the work that we are doing with rape crisis here in saying it is our decision to prosecute, nevertheless, we will engage with you. We want to hear from you. We want to know why you are reluctant and we want to take steps to re-engage and support or take that decision, which I have taken in the last few weeks since the 12th of March, to take that decision not 
to carry on with the prosecution. And that will continue. He wants to intervene. He's been in his feet a wee while, but it's an yes. intervention, you see. Yes. Are you taking it, Solicitor so, General? You are. Yes. Solicitor General, you say this policy isn't about compelling witnesses, and yet you say that the, the courts reserve the right to do so. And those are the, exactly the words which I think send a real chill to, to victims considering. So could you just ag agree with me or say whether you would consider or not actually giving the right of witnesses, the right of victims to refuse to give uh, evidence. And, and while I understand you want to explore the possibility of continuing when they express reluctance, surely ultimately there, there must be a right to refuse to give evidence if you're a victim of rape. Solicitor General. Uh, no, I can't agree with that. And the difficulty with that uh, is, is legal and ethical and comes down to positive obligations and convention rights, which we are subject to. We have a responsibility to take positive, uh, to, uh, uh, positive action to protect the rights of those who are subjected to, um, to, to rape and uh, serious sexual violence. I'm running out of time. I, I can give you it. a little extra. We must conclude by 6.20, 6 but I think it's important to allow this debate yes. to run, and I appreciate that from the Solicitor General. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. I I'm grateful for your taking the intervention, Solicitor General. Would you, would you like to comment on how you would view the quality of the evidence that would be obtained in these circumstances with that level of compulsion, please? Solicitor General. I can't envisage a situation where we would compel a witness who's evidence was going to be of such a quality that there would be no prospect of a conviction and indeed no um, public interest in requiring her to come to court. So you're right to identify the quality of evidence as, as an issue which we will take into account looking at all of the factors. But if we have a serious a serial sexual offender uh, who is a risk to others, who's got previous convictions, who may be um, maybe getting out in parole, if we don't prosecute, whatever, we have to balance the risk of not proceeding against the risk of proceeding. Joanne Lamont. It's to assist people who, who are not as expert in the law, but who in all of my adult life working with organisations like Rape Crisis, the very strongest message is the system makes it worse. Can you explain to me why a message which says the reason we've got low conviction rates is because of the victim and not because of the system is going to help. Solicitor General. That, that, that's not the message which we uh, have given, and that's not the message we intend, and it's not the message that we um, hope our, our friends and supporters at Rape Crisis and the police will, will add. I entirely agree that um, part of the solution to this is to improve the system, and we're working hard, very hard with colleagues to address those parts of the process that lead to reluctance and cause such pressures for the uh, victims. And I, I too welcome Lord Carloway's ambitious statement uh, this morning regarding pre-recording of evidence. That's, that would be a, a, a worthy and really useful goal. But in the meantime, we have to work with the system that we have. And as prosecutors, we have to protect the women and children in our society and we have to take the right decisions for the right reasons in deciding whether to prosecute, deciding whether to uh, require a complainer to give evidence. This is not a policy of, compl of compelling complainers. It is not a policy of compelling complainers. It is a policy of uh, retaking the decision-making power in relation to rape and serious sexual offences. It shouldn't be, and it can't be, in terms of ECHR and positive obligations, it can't be the decision of the complainer. That is all. The Solicitor General would take a, a brief intervention. It's up to you, Solicitor General. Well, if you're up, yes. yes. I, simply because I, you know, I, I have no experience of the law, so it would be helpful if you could clarify what's changed between before the 12th of March when you couldn't compel witnesses, and now. Um, have previous Solicitor Generals been, or Lord Advocates, been operating the law inappropriately? And I'm afraid it's very important, but we must conclude on the button at 6.20, so if you're concluding a mark on that, please. Um, since the, tw the 12th of March was when we, we got the policy together, having consulted widely with rape crisis, with other agencies, 
with, serious, with senior prosecutors and so on. What had happened and what we took account of was developments in the European Court of Human Rights, which made it clear that where states and state prosecutors didn't take action in relation to offenders who were at risk of causing harm, because of a lack of engagement by the complainer, where that was the reason for, for prosecutors not to take action, and that man later went on to kill the complainer's mother and rape her, then the European Court of Human Rights found that the state had failed in its positive obligations. So that is the legal context uh, for a European dimension. I may say, looking at it, this is a policy and a practice which uh, is, is held by our colleagues south of the border and up many other European jurisdictions. So it, it, it was about doing the right thing it, and supporting complainers, supporting victims. And the last thing that we want is for a message to go out to chill uh, their, their uh, willingness to, to come forward. I would be very happy to continue these, this conversation. I'm sorry that some of you weren't able to come to the briefing, but that in itself was too short for MSPs. So, thank you. Can I, can I thank you? Can I thank all members and Solicitor General? And it's such an important matter. Members may wish to consider speaking to their business managers for another context for this debate. Thank you all very much. And I close this meeting.